Uh, we are in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, crazy stuff that we're looking at. Um, last week we uh, saw the rise of the Antichrist. Uh, this morning we will look at the rise of the false prophet, who is the right-hand man for the Antichrist during this uh, time of great tribulation. Um We've also seen that uh, the Antichrist comes to power after the rapture of the church. Uh, in Revelation, the rapture takes place in chapter 4, verse 1. That's when John is caught up into heaven, and his whole perspective changes in chapter 4 and 5. He is around the throne of God, and we're singing uh, up there as well, as you read the song that we sing to the Lord. That's for the body of Christ. And then in chapter 6, when Jesus begins to unloose the seven seals, the first seal that he unlooses is chapter 6, verse 2, and that's when the Antichrist comes on the scene. Initially, he comes as a peacemaker, and you know you think there's going to be a lot of chaos on planet Earth after the rapture, and uh, he'll come and try to settle everybody down, get everybody thinking he's this great peacemaker, but then halfway through, uh, his true colors show. He'll go into the... Uh, rebuilt temple there in Jerusalem that he allows the Jews to build and he says worship me I am God and that is known as the abomination of desolation Daniel the prophet spoke of this in Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 to 27 Jesus reiterates that prophecy in uh, Matthew 24 15 when he says when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet let the reader understand and then it's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, that uh, the Apostle Paul tells us about the Antichrist who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so again, this is the abomination of desolation. And as we pick up in chapter 13, verse 11, we're introduced to the, the third member of what we call the unholy trinity because God's trinity, you got the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit points people to Jesus. Jesus points people to the Father. This unholy trinity, you have this guy that we look at this morning known as the false prophet. He will point people to the Antichrist. They worship him. He is God, but he's not. The Antichrist is working for Satan. So that's the unholy trinity. So we'll see they, they try to lie to people and deceive people through all these lying signs and wonders. And he'll be so convincing that most of the people in this world are going to follow after the Antichrist. They will take the mark of the beast, the mark of the Antichrist, the infamous 666. And if you do, the Bible promises us, we'll see this later in the book of Revelation, that whoever takes that mark uh, will be lost for eternity in the lake of fire. So let's take a look at this false prophet here in chapter 13. But before we do, let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we pray that we would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the warnings that you give us. We thank you for the assurance that we have that we are sealed into the body of Christ. And that spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit who has sealed us, is infinitely stronger than any uh, mark that the enemy could place upon any person. And so we thank you, Lord, that we are safe, we are secure in your hands. And Lord, we thank you that uh, you have a plan and purpose for us now which is to be light and salt to those around us that we would proclaim the gospel the good news of jesus to a lost and dying world around us and lord that we would uh, warn people of what's ahead because we know that once your bride your church is removed then it's going to be crazy beyond description uh, hard to understand how bad things are going to be in this world once the bride of christ is removed lord your wrath will be poured out we know that the enemy will be allowed to do horrendous things as demons are let loose upon the people of this world we know that there's going to be major warfare 
Ultimately, the Battle of Armageddon will take place during this seven-year period. And so, Lord, may we be um, those who warn those around us, but first of all, love those around us and point them to you, Jesus. You are this world's only hope. And Lord, when we get to the second coming, when you return in chapter 19, oh, how glorious that's going to be because you're going to take this world that's on the brink of annihilation at that time and you are going to uh, turn this world into a Garden of Eden-like state uh, for a thousand years. How beautiful, how glorious that will be and we'll be with you, Lord, in our resurrection bodies. And so, Father, I pray that you would prepare our hearts for what we look at in, in the book of Revelation, but also prepare our hearts for the daily battles that we face as we live in this fallen world. And we just commit our time to you now, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so Revelation 13. Again, we pick up in verse 11. We saw the rise of the Antichrist, chapter 13, verse 1. This beast that rises up from the sea, that's the Antichrist. This is a beast. It says in verse 11, I saw another beast, John says, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So this is what we will know as the false prophet uh, in the book of Revelation. We know this is a false prophet because he's called the false prophet a few times after this. Uh, by the way, the, the Antichrist and the false prophet are two distinct people. Um, in chapter 16, verse 13, chapter 19, verse 30 or 20, and then also in chapter 20, verse 10, we see these two mentioned together, the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. These will be the, the most lying and deceiving and destructive leaders this world has ever seen. But according to Revelation 19, verse 20, um, they will be the first two people to inhabit the lake of fire. Chapter 19, verse 20, it says that when Jesus returns and we come back with him, one of the first things that takes place is the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. Satan is not thrown into the lake of fire until a little over a thousand years later. He's locked up in the abyss for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. But then it says that after the thousand years, Satan is let loose to tempt those who are still in their natural bodies on planet Earth. And then God will strike him down and destroy the enemies of God once and for all. And then Satan gets thrown into the lake of fire. Chapter 20, verse 10 says where the beast and the false prophet are. And so they will be there for eternity. And unfortunately, all those who rebel against God, who follow the lies of the enemy, they rejected Jesus Christ, they will end up in the lake of fire as well. Notice in verse 11 here, the false prophet will come in like a lamb, but he's going to be a puppet in the hands of Satan. He will be able to convince the world that the, that the Antichrist, this beast, um, is the Messiah. He's going to be telling people he is the true Savior of the world. That's why he's the anti-Christ. He's not only against Christ, but he's in place of Christ. That's what anti means. As he comes on the scene as a lamb, it speaks of humility, his gentleness, but underneath is a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's what Jesus warned us about in Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And that's what this guy will be. Uh, Jesus mentions the false prophet and the Antichrist in Matthew 24, uh, verses 23 through 25. This is right after Jesus warns about the abomination of desolation. He says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets, so you get the Antichrist and the false prophet and many of their minions, will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect, see I have told you beforehand. The elect there are the Jews. Now remember, the great tribulation, that seven-year period, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is another name for Israel. It's a time where God is dealing directly with the Jews once again, according to Jeremiah 30, verse 7. 
Daniel calls it the 70th week of Daniel. It's uh, remember when Gabriel shows up and tells Daniel, 490 years or 77s have been given to you and your people. And then he tells them what's going to happen in this time frame. The first 69 sevens or 483 years have already taken place. Because he says to Daniel, when, you, when the decree goes forth to rebuild Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, well, we're told in Nehemiah chapter 2, and that was given to Nehemiah by King Artaxerxes. He goes back to Jerusalem. He begins to build the walls around Jerusalem. That was March 14th, 445 B.C. You go 483 years into the future from then, and Daniel is told by Gabriel, then Messiah will be cut off or suffer the death penalty. Well, that's when Jesus shows up and he rides in on the donkey. He's put to death. That's a 483-year period. There's a final 70-year period that's for the Jewish people. That's why he says, if it's possible, even the elect, the Jews, would be deceived. But Jesus warns the Jews in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation, when, when the Antichrist goes into the temple and says, worship me, I'm God, flee, get out of Israel. And we've talked about this before. They flee probably to the area around Petra. So look at verse 12. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast. So here we see the false prophet having the same power, the authority of the first beast. We we're told that we saw last week that Satan gives the Antichrist all of his power and authority. So this guy is going to be demon possessed as well. He has all the authority, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, beast whose deadly wound was healed. We see three times in this chapter the Antichrist has a deadly wound that is healed. Maybe he's assassinated and he looks like he's dead and he comes back to life, but as a result of this, everybody in the world is going to be worshiping the Antichrist, thinking he is the true Messiah. So even though the false prophet has the same authority, as the Antichrist, he is going to be pointing people to the Antichrist. He's going to be pointing people to worship the Antichrist. Who is like the beast, he'll say. Uh, we see the false prophet pointing people to universal worship. Uh, can you imagine all the religions of the world? Once a church is gone, all the world's uh, uh, religious uh, systems of the world are going to unite together, and they're going to be required to worship the first beast or the Antichrist. Now, as Christians, we have the tendency to think that the world's becoming more and more secular around us and less spiritual. Um, in the church, we're becoming less dependent upon the Lord and His Word, unfortunately, but the world has always been spiritual. The world is always gravitating towards spiritual things. Unfortunately, the enemy stirs up a lot of spiritual passion within people to worship mother nature to worship gaia you look at so many of the movies that are out there and it started way back when i mean even george lucas says you know we are all into worshiping uh, pagan practices i mean the whole thing with the force has nothing to do with jesus i mean it's a fun entertaining movie but he, the bottom line is he is all about worshiping the world james cameron and avatar that's all about worshiping Gaia or Mother Earth and the energy that comes from Mother Earth. It's all pointing to these pagan practices, all these New Age Eastern mysticism practices. They're all opposed to the Word of God. They're all opposed to Jesus Christ. But again, there's this hunger for people to have an, a, a spiritual experience somehow. And that's a void that all of us have, I think everyone that's created has this void in our hearts, but God created us to worship. But who are you going to worship? What are you going to worship? Only Jesus Christ can fill that void. And yet so many people in the world are trying to fill that void in their lives through pagan practices, drugs, sex. You can name anything out there, but it's always trying to fill a void that can only be satisfied in Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus tells us in his word over and over again. You remember the woman at the well in John chapter 4. She is just broken. She's been married five times. The guy she's with now is not her husband, and 
she is just at the end of her life, basically, just broken. And Jesus gets into this uh, conversation with her, and he gives her words of hope, words of encouragement. He wants to bring her to salvation. And so this is what we read in John 4, verse 13. You know, and she's wondering, where are we supposed to worship God? And Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water, speaking of the well that they're standing by, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. It's only going to be satisfied your spiritual void through Jesus Christ. He alone can give you eternal life, forgiveness of sin, a real meaning and purpose to your life. Everything in this world will leave you wanting something else, wanting something more, but you'll never be satisfied. Jesus says in John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. In other words, for all of us who have searched for truth, you've searched for, well, many of you grew up in the generation of peace and love back in the 60s and early 70s, looking for peace and love in the world, and you couldn't find it. But all of you who have been looking for peace and love, you always came up empty, you always were short because... This world cannot satisfy. But the very moment you ask Jesus to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, then you experience rivers of living water. Then you experience freedom from sin, forgiveness of sin. Then, and only then, you realize, I am a new creation in Christ. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And I'm a child of God. But it's only through that relationship with Jesus Christ. The only thing Satan can do is try to keep people from discovering the truth about Christ and, and the Lord's love for them and the eternal life that God has for them. And so he will offer an endless supply of empty things in this world. And many of us, and I was there, you look for religion, you look through drugs, you look through relationships, you look through all these things that never satisfy. They're just cheap substitutes, they're distractions. And here we see at the time of the Great Tribulation, this false prophet will be pointing people to the Antichrist. He'll be telling people, look to him. Look, his deadly wound is healed. You know, who can make war against this guy? He has the answers you're looking for, but what makes this message so effective is this guy, the Antichrist and the false prophet, he'll back it up with lying signs and wonders. And that's what we're told. Look at verse 13. He, speaking of the false prophet, performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So again, the false prophet will use his miraculous powers to deceive the whole world. And consider how vulnerable the world's going to be at this time. Again, the rapture's taking place. There's going to be chaos for a season. The Antichrist comes in the scene having supposedly all the answers to what's going on in the world. But then we see in the first half of the Great Tribulation, chapter 6, we saw one-fourth of the world's population will be killed by God's wrath, His judgment. We're going to see earthquakes in the first half that are going to shake everything in this world. Before you get to the halfway point, another third of the world is put to death when all these demons are let loose in chapter 9. So with two, two judgments, half of the world's population is destroyed. This is why it's called the Great Tribulation. The second half of those seven-year period, that three and a half years, that's going to be even worse. Crazy stuff. Deception beyond imagination. Earthquakes, fires, drought... Uh, we see that a third of all the waters at this point will be totally polluted, destroyed, poisoned. A third of all the ships destroyed. Um, 
I mean, we just saw, and many of you have been watching what's going on in Turkey and Syria with the earthquakes. You know, they had just a sizable number, you know, 6.8 earthquakes and all the aftershocks. I just saw this morning 130 uh, engineers and builders have been arrested by the Turkish government because these are new buildings that they said were earthquake proof, and yet they all crumbled. It's over 30,000 they say have died. They're looking at probably 50,000 that are, they're going to find that have died through these earthquakes. Those are minor earthquakes compared to what's going to happen in the Great Tribulation. We're told there will be three earthquakes that shake the entire world. I mean, every fault line out there is going to split and rupture, and we're, we're told mountains are going to go down. Islands are going to disappear. It's going to be brutal beyond our comprehension. And so the world at this time is going to be ripe for someone who claims to have the answers. That's what the Antichrist and the false prophet will try to fill that void. And again, we see that he's nothing but a counterfeit. Notice it says he's able to call fire down from heaven. Why is that miracle mentioned? Because this shows us that Satan is nothing but a counterfeit. God brings fire down from heaven. He brought it down on Sodom and Gomorrah. When Elijah the prophet was going against the 450 prophets of Baal, it says fire came down from heaven, consumed that sacrifice of Elijah's, proving that God is true. Baal is, you know, false. We, we saw back in chapter 11 of Revelation, the two witnesses, probably Moses and Elijah, they're able to call fire down from heaven. And so here we see the false prophet calling fire down from heaven and trying to get people to see, we can do this too. We're, we're the ones you need to follow. This is why it is so important for all of us to stay close to Jesus Christ, to hold fast to his word and not deviate from God's word because a lot of people will say, oh, look at these signs and wonders, and then they'll give you a different message. Look at the gold dust falling from our church ceiling. And then they come up with a different message, a different gospel. That's happening throughout Christendom in America, especially today. You get all these lying signs and wonders, and so how do you judge those things? You go back to the Word of God. If what they say does not line up with the Word of God, they're a false teacher, a false prophet. The, the Word of God is our final authority. I mean, our verse for our church from the very beginning has been Romans 10, 17, where it says, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You want your faith to grow? It's not by seeing signs and wonders, but it's by digging into the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You need to spend time in the word of God, not chasing after lying signs and wonders. Remember the definition of faith? Um, you ladies that are in the women's Bible study just saw this recently. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, we believe in God. We place our trust in Jesus Christ because we believe the testimony that God has given us concerning Jesus from the word of God. Every religion says, oh, we believe in Jesus. I came out of a cult that says, oh, we believe in Jesus, but he was just a Christ scientist, Christian science. I believe in Jesus, next door to us says, yeah, he is the spirit brother of Lucifer. Or I believe in Jesus, says the JW say, but he is Michael the archangel, a created being. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Only the Jesus of the Bible can save you. And so we see a perfect example of this as far as, you know, believing the Word of God, and not just seeing through Doubting Thomas. You remember Doubting Thomas? He was one of the disciples, one of the twelve, and you know Judas already committed you know, suicide. He was gone. And then Jesus rises from the grave. He appears that uh, first Sunday morning to the women, and then later that evening he comes to the house. All the disciples are there except for Thomas. And they're all excited. They're blown away. Jesus is here, and he proves himself. He's alive. And then they tell Thomas, Thomas, he's risen. What was his response? I'm not going to believe unless I can put my finger in the hole in his hand. If I can put my hand in the hole in his side where the Roman spear went in, I'm not going to believe. And so eight days later, Jesus reappears, 
and Thomas is with them, and Jesus says, okay, put your hand here on my side. Put your hand here and hold, you know, your finger in my hole here. Don't be unbelieving, but believe. And what was Thomas's response? John 20, verses 28 and 29. He, Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Yep. Pretty obvious then. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those, this would be you and me, who have not seen and yet have believed. That's genuine faith. I've never seen the risen Lord and Savior, but I know he's alive, risen from the dead. His word, you know, proclaims this. Archaeology backs it up. Prophecy backs it up. But for me, I've experienced his healing touch. I've experienced the new birth. I was living for the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the moment he came into my life, he changed me radically. I could never change myself. I was going down a path of destruction. So I know Jesus is alive, risen from the dead. And many of you do as well because you have faith and trust in him. Even though you have not seen, Jesus said, you have believed. The only evidence we need of that being true is the fact that God's word tells us Jesus will come into a person's life when they receive him. I mean, when he's praying to the Father in John 17, Jesus you know, says that the Father and Jesus will come and dwell in us. He says, I won't leave you as orphans. I'll give you the Holy Spirit. He'll come and dwell within you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So we have experienced eternal life through the, the risen living Lord and Savior dwelling inside of us. And so that's why we need to be careful when it comes to signs and wonders. Satan can do some pretty amazing things, but his goal is always to turn people away from the truth of God's word and be turned aside to fables or stories or emotionalism or all these things that are contrary to the word of God. Yes, we can be emotional when we worship the Lord, but again, it always comes back to the truth of God's word is the final authority, not somebody's feelings, not whether gold dust fell from the ceiling, not whether somebody's leg was lengthened or whatever they might say. He is God based on the truth of his word. He is co-creator of the heavens and the earth, Nothing is impossible with God. I mean, Jesus is still the great physician. He heals broken hearts. Many of your hearts were broken before you got saved. Some of you have gone through broken hearts even after you've been saved. Jesus has healed your heart. He will heal broken lives. He can heal broken marriages. He still heals the sick. He still casts out demons. He still raises dead. He still cleanses lepers. Um, I mentioned this first service, talked to Emily about this. There was a guy that I met over in India, and he was, uh, he was before he was saved, he was a leper. Remember him? Well, you remember him, obviously. And, I mean, he was full-on leprosy. His, you know, lost his fingers. Things are disappearing because he was eating them up. And missionary or church planners, you know, pray with him. He gets saved, and the leprosy stopped. You know, he didn't get any treatment, just the leprosy stopped. And I got to meet him when I was there a few years back. And he just went home to be with the Lord last year. But that guy, man, he would tell everybody. He was so vocal about his faith. He'd go up to anybody and tell them what God has done for me, how he saved me. That not only, you know, stopping the leprosy, but above all, giving him eternal life. I mean, God is in the business of changing lives. The bottom line is we are to walk by faith, not by sight. And never forget the message of any legitimate servant of God will always line up with God's word. It will always line up with the true gospel of Jesus Christ, which is Jesus died for you. He loved you so much. He went to the cross and died for you. He lived a perfect life because only he could fulfill all the law and the prophets. You know, you have to be perfect, even as your heavenly father is perfect. Remember when Jesus said that in Matthew 5, 48? The Jews are like, whoa, wait a minute, we can't be perfect. Jesus was perfect on your behalf. He fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law. Every 
little jot of the law. He fulfilled it all so that he could qualify to be the perfect lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He would die as a perfect final sacrifice. His blood was perfect and spotless. And only the perfect spotless blood of Jesus can wash away your sins and my sins forever. And it's only because he went into that tomb and three days later rose from the dead that he, and that, he can now give eternal life. If he stayed dead and buried, then we're all, of all people, most to be pitied, Paul says. But because he conquered the grave, he's alive forevermore, he's here and says, if you need eternal life, I will give you eternal life. He won't force it on you, but if you'll say yes to Jesus, I'm a sinner, Lord, I can't save myself. I know where I'm going when I die without you. He'll rescue you. He will save you. He will cause you to be born again. He'll give you eternal life. Only the risen Savior can. This is why Jesus warns us time and time again about false prophets. He says you will know them by their fruits. Their fruit is rotten. Their message is rotten. It will not bring health to you, so avoid them. One of the strongest warnings we have in God's word about spotting and recognizing false prophets is found in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 13, starting in verse 1. Check this out. This is God speaking to Moses. He says, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and notice, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass. So it's legitimate. It looks like a real miracle. Of which he spoke to you saying, let us go after other gods. I had a burning in the bosom. I know it's true. Let's follow this Jesus that's a spirit brother of Lucifer. That's exactly what he's saying here. Let's go after this other God, you know, that's not the God of the Bible. Even though it was miraculous things happening here, he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known. Let us serve them. Notice what God says. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord, that's Yahweh your God. So we are encouraged, exhorted, Test everything through the Word of God. Don't believe whatever anybody says. Don't believe what I say. You test everything with the Word of God. First John chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle John, who was used to write Revelation, says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. How do we test them? Ask simple questions. What do you say about Jesus? Who is he? What is his nature? What is his character? How are you saved? You just ask basic questions. It will become very evident very quickly if they are of the Lord, if they believe the word of God, or if they have another Jesus that they're following. Just ask him, is the Bible the only inerrant word of God, or do we need other books? Do we need other new revelations from God? I've said it for years. You know, it's Genesis through Revelation, period. That's what we hold fast to. And I've been told by uh, a couple people in the church, you should say it's from Genesis to Revelation, exclamation mark, period. So that's true. It usually doesn't take very long when you start asking questions to determine if that's a sister, a brother in Christ, or a wolf in sheep's clothing. Again, during this time frame of the Great Tribulation, the people will be easily deceived by this false prophet. Another verse to check out, 2 Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 9. It finds its fulfillment here in Revelation 13. The coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and, notice, lying wonders with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth 
the word of God, that God loves us, that Jesus died for us, that they might be saved. And for this reason, because they've rejected God's word and the love of the truth, God will send them, this is speaking specifically of the great tribulation, strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That definite article, the lie, refers to the lie of Satan in the garden when he tempted Adam and Eve. You won't die, you'll be just like God. That's the lie. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says that's the lie. That they'll turn away from the true living God and they'll turn to side to, you know, these things of the world and the flesh. So he says they should believe the lie that they may be con that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now look at verse 14 again because the false prophet will order the people of this world to make an image of the beast. Does this mean everyone will be required to own their own personal idol? I don't know how this is going to play out um, when he says everybody in the world will be required to worship this beast. There's going to be an idol of the beast set up in the uh, rebuilt temple there. Um, you can get into all kinds of weird ideas and fanciful thoughts, and you look at what go what's going on with AI today, artificial intelligence. If you're on TikTok, China already knows everything about you. You know, if you're on different websites, they know everything about you. I mean, this world is very, very integrated uh, techn technologically. I try to avoid as much as I can. I'm pretty ignorant when it comes to these things, but it's very possible that the whole world is going to be linked to this idol that everybody's going to be required to worship. And if they don't worship, we're going to see in a moment, everybody who doesn't worship this beast, the idol of the image of the beast, will die. Take a look. Look at verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Years ago when I was a kid and go to Disneyland and they'd have that animatron of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> if any of you saw that, I mean, you think back, it's like, wow, that was dorky. When I was a kid, it's like, wow, that looks like Abraham Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago. I mean, it was just weird. I mean, te technology is so crazy today with holograms and everything else they can create. And you put on the 3D glasses and all this stuff you see, you think you're falling and blah, blah, blah. I mean, things are falling into place for the Antichrist very quickly. We're putting all these pieces together very quickly. Um, somehow the false prophet gives breath, it says, to this idol. The Greek word for breath here is pneuma. We're created in the image and likeness of God. It says we have a body, soul, spirit, spirit pneuma. The Holy Spirit, holy pneuma. Uh, evil spirits, pneuma. They can inhabit beings. They can inhabit animals, demonic spirits. Somehow this thing will look like it's alive and people will be required to worship it. Only God has the power to bring something to life out of nothing. It's called divine fiat. Genesis 1.1 is where we're told in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The word created there is bara in the Hebrew, which means to create something out of nothing. Only God can do that. So Hebrews 11 verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So God created something out of nothing. I bring this up because the false prophet appears to bring this image of the Antichrist to life. But this is a perfect example of a lying sign and wonder. Everybody's thinking, this thing's alive. They will be required to worship this. Again, I think it's demonic. Comes to life somehow. But Jesus, you know, he cast demons out of people. He cast the legion of demons out of that one guy um, they can inhabit all kinds of different things and people and animals again this image of the beast will i believe be set up in the temple of god or the temple in jerusalem it's not god's temple after the antichrist commits the abomination of desolation and once again if the people on the earth 
are to make an image of the idol. And they have to bow down to it. I have no idea how this works. Um, you look at what Elon Musk is doing. Um, Neur Neuralink. Some of you have heard of Neuralink where he wants to put a chip. And it sounds good because they want to put a chip in your brain. And this is for people that have like blindness or... Um, you know, they're paralyzed and they put this chip in your brain and they can get you to move and walk and all kinds of things. Sounds good. Um, depends on who's right, running on the other side of the computer. You know, if part of that mark of the beast is going to be some implant in your right hand or forehead, do they just need to hit a computer button? And then if you don't worship the image of the beast, boop, you're dead because everybody's going to be put to death. It doesn't worship the image of the beast. There's so many weird stuff about this. It's hard to you know pin it down. But um, the, the interesting thing about Elon Musk is he just said in December, less than three months ago, within six months we're going to have humans getting this um, neuroplant, Neuralink implant. We're going to we're, we're ready for human trials. Now I wouldn't want to be the first one to go through that human trial because so far they've tested it on many monkeys and every single monkey has died. That's not a good thing to know before you get this put in you. But we're getting close. I mean you see like in Sweden, many, many people, a huge percentage of Sweden now has this little chip in their right hand, some in their left, doesn't matter with them. It's not the mark of the beast, but they have this little chip and all their banking information's on there. Sweden's way advanced in this stuff. They'll, you know, just go up to your door and unlocks for you. You go to your bank, wave it in front of something. You go to the grocery store, just scan it. Everything's taken care of. Everything's pointing towards the last days in the mark of the beast. So look at these verses. We'll wrap it up here shortly. Um, they cause all those to worship the image of the beast. We see that word worship here in verse 15, used many times in chapter 13 here. False worship. Idolatry is something God is obviously against. After he says, you shall have no other gods before me, the very second commandment is about idolatry. Look at this verse in Exodus 20, verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is under the water, uh, in the water under the earth. Here's why. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations to those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. And yet sinful humans are always trying to use their five senses to worship God. Be careful when people say you need to worship God with your five senses. You know, touch, taste, smell, all those things. You got to hear him. Be careful. God is spirit. We worship him in spirit and truth, right? That's what Jesus tells us. In uh, John 4, 24, speaking to the woman at the well, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, of course, we believe that God can and has touched our lives in many wonderful ways. He has spoken to us from his word in many wonderful ways, but it's not through our fleshly senses that God does these things for us, but it says we humble ourselves before him and we read the word, we believe the word, we trust what he says, and the Holy Spirit will bring his word to life within us. But be careful when, and a lot of churches are getting into this, where you have to taste and touch and smell, and that's why they'll burn incense. You know, they'll have sand, like a sandbox where you'll write your secret sin in and then wipe it over like Jesus, wiping your sins away. We don't need that. I know my sins are wiped away, not because I write my sins in a sandbox. Maybe it's kitty litter. No, we, we know by faith he's washed our sins away. You believe what his word says. And, and so many people are getting into all this touchy-feely stuff. Again, God can touch us. We can sense his presence. But be careful because then you can start getting into idolatry where you light candles thinking that's going to draw you closer to the Lord. Nothing wrong with having a giant elk head or a deer head hanging in your house. That's fine. 
The problem is if you start bowing down to that elk head and worshiping it. No problem having candles because you have a husband that smells. So you have candles burning. But if you're lighting those candles thinking that's going to draw you closer to Jesus, then you're mistaken. You know, be careful with these things. The only time these things would be prohibited is if we're trying to use these things to make contact with the spiritual realm. Again, look at verse 16. Here we see the infamous 666 mentioned. So the Antichrist, the false prophet, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast, the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So this false prophet will require that every single human being during this time of the Great Tribulation will have some kind of mark on their right hand or forehead, and you can't buy or sell. Again, what, what do we see? A third at this point, a third of all the freshwater supplies and the seawater has been poisoned. It's been destroyed. A third of all the trees have been burned up. All the green grass has been burned up. There's going to be sh food shortages all over the place, and it's going to be very, very tightly controlled. Who can get food? Who can get these rations? And you cannot get anything unless you have that mark of the beast. We're, we're going to see that if you don't get the mark of the beast, you will be put to death. They'll hunt you down. Some might make it through the Great Tribulation. The very few, I think, will make it through the Great Tribulation. So be careful. I mean, this is a way to get rid of all credit cards. There will be no need for cash. Your gold and silver stockpiles will be worthless. Cryptocurrency, I don't recommend it. Especially if you, what was that, what's his name? Sam, Sam guy. Young punk that blew billions of dollars on stuff. And Friedman, Sam Friedman, bank or whatever it was. Don't ever go that direction. Be careful. Right now, there is a lack of privacy in everything. As I mentioned earlier, if you're on TikTok, China already has all your information. The federal government has purchased and is using uh, social media in every realm to track you. I mean, they can track everything we do now through your cell phone, through your GPS in your car, through your computer. And it's all culminating to a point where it's going to be this mark is required for you to be able to buy anything or sell anything Again, we're going to be gone. So warn the people that are still here. If they come around and say, you can't buy or sell without this, don't take it. That's the death knell, so to speak. That'll be like the abomination of desolation. Whoever takes the, the mark of the beast, we're told, will not be able to be saved. Because this will show their complete devotion to the Antichrist. So what is this 666? Um, in Greek and Hebrew, there's numerical equivalents where like A equals B, or A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3. Um, some say, oh, this will spell out who the Antichrist is. They've tried to do that. Ronald Reagan, no, nah, well, he wasn't it. Henry Kissinger, I mean, there's a lot of different names they've come up with, and it's never, it's not true. I, I think it's going to be just a prefix to... Whatever you get on your computer, you have to do 666 on your computer first. And then you put in your passcode. And that'll allow them to see, okay, you logged on. You're worshiping the idol there on your screen. You're good to go. If you don't go on it, they could hit another button and you're dead. I mean, who knows? I'm just, you know, thinking out loud, which is not ever good to do. <laughs> but... Um, 666, it's the number of human imperfection. Six is the number of man. Seven is the number of completion. Eight is the number of new beginnings. So somehow this ties into, you know, man thinking he can have what he needs and what he wants. And we're seeing all this technology come into implementation right before our very eyes. Um, if you ever look at, you can Google Elon Musk and AI, the Neuralink, crazy stuff. You can look at another one as Yuval 
Noah Harari, go on his site. I mean, all kinds of stuff on these guys, and they're just nuts. I mean, he's saying that you can have eternal life, and he says there is no God. Jesus is a myth, but you can have eternal life because through AI, you're going to be linked to the cloud. You'll live forever. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. But these guys, world standards, they're brilliant. Unfortunately, they're going to lead a lot of people astray. So here's wisdom. Let who has, him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. Is the number of a man? His number is six six six. I remember when you know the old movies came out when these you know this was popular back in the late sixties and seventies. They're like six 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 scratched on your forehead or on your hand, and and then it was the barcode across your forehead or on your hand, and smaller than a grain of rice. And they've already done this with soldiers. They've already, you know, pets that get the implants. Hey, it's a track your pet. It gets lost. You want to know where it is. Hey, it's great. And it's all great. The mark of the beast isn't great. But they can put so much information, just a little sliver under the skin, and they can track you. They can, you know, it's great for Alzheimer patients. They get lost and wander. They can find them. But it's all pointing towards what's coming down the road. And this is what Jesus says about the hour being late you know, we need to be about the Father's business. Jesus says about these last days, Luke 21, verses 27 to 28, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. This is the end of the great tribulation when Jesus returns and we come back with him. Now, when these things begin to happen, so we're seeing all these things beginning to happen right now around us, look up. Lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. You know, we're looking up. We know Jesus could come back at any moment. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the rapture is going to take place. As Paul tells us there in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, God himself is going to blow that trumpet. And when the trumpet sounds, the Lord is going to catch us up to be with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. I'm not looking forward to the Antichrist, but I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus Christ. Amen.